Hey everybody, Tamara here, and I am pretty darn excited for today's interview. So let me let me just give you a little bit of why, and then I'm going to let my guest introduce himself because I think he'll do the best job. So as many of you know, I decided to train for my first Ironman, which is let's see, let me make sure I get this right, Dave. Two point three mile swim, hundred twelve mile bike ride, and then a marathon, basically of running. You you were close. <laughs> Oh, I was close. Okay, well, I should probably know that before I do it. Um, so one of the things I've really come to realize in all this training is that there are a lot of lessons in training that really do apply to life, work, goals, success as well. And as I started digging into this training, I all roads really led to this man, Dave Scott, who has one Ironman who, who is in the Hall of Fame, who just who has done incredible things and I think accomplished incredible feats that most of us would just go, wow, like that, that is just amazing. So Dave, welcome to Inside Launch Street. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are? And then I have, I have so many questions for you. Well, thank you, Tamar. Thank, thank you for having me on your show. And um, when you cued me into your show, I did my homework. And yeah. uh, so I know a lot about you. I know that you've had some great guests on your show. So hopefully I can, uh, offer uh, some s seeds of hope for some of your listeners and, and um, yeah. I welcome their questions as, as well. So uh, I kind of fell into Ironman and before the sport even had a name, uh, I did a, my first triathlon in 1976. So that ages me quite a while back. The wow. first Hawaii Ironman, uh, which wasn't denoted as the world championship was in 1978. I did an 80. And in 1980, uh, most people didn't know what they were doing. And I just thought, well, this is a race. I'm going to try to race this. And if I fall apart, I do. And that was sort of my debut. And, and it, was, it was covered by Wide World of Sports. And at that time, there were no cable channels. So people got a glimpse of the sport. And they sort of knew me and thought, maybe this is pretty ludicrous. Why this guy do this? And uh, but that was my start. And then I end, ended up uh, racing through the 80s. I won six times during the 80s. And I had... Three, three seconds, a second also in the 80s and 89 and 94, and then kind of finished my Ironman business in 1996. So, okay, I have so many questions for you, Dave. So I love how you say all that stuff, like, and I won six times, but I just, for listeners, I, I just want you to know, like, the, the training is not something you do in a month. It's not off the couch. Like, this is something that is, this is a long haul to get to an Ironman, to get to just one. You've done many, and you won six of them all in Hawaii, right? Is that right? Yeah, Hawaii is the, the world championships and, and, okay. and there's Ironman races around the world. So they're on every continent and, and there's a, a, a combined half Ironman and Ironman, there's 140 races worldwide. So you can pick Ironman races, but sort of the, the, the granddaddy or grandmother of, of all the races is uh, still Kona, still Ironman Hawaii. And that's the one people have to qualify for based on these other races. So it, it, it's still the, the one that people are going after. Got it. So he, here's my starting question for you. So motivation is one thing. Motivation is great to get us started in whatever it is we want to succeed, succeed in. But to do an Ironman and to do it over and over again takes more than motivation. I think it takes kind of more of an internal drive. So I'm curious for someone like you, what, what is that drive for you and how do you find it? Well, I, I don't know if it's any different for, for me and uh, any other person that has aspirations in you know, other areas of life. I, I think it's pretty easy to become complacent. Mm -hmm. And once you become complacent, whatever you're doing, it, complacency breeds mediocrity. Mm -hmm. and, and so I always feel like when, when people go to a point, it, it's fine to idle. It's fine to have downtime, easy time, but you should always have your... Uh, mind and body sort of revved up ready to do it and, and I, I think a lot of people avoid taking i'll say calculated risks and these risks are, are are really important because it sort of sets the the barometer for your mind to say hey i can i can attain these it's a little seed that you plant yeah. and it also creates a vulnerability because a lot of people say well i, I don't want to do that because i might fail and it's along with these risks, I think a lot of people have the, the fear of the unknown and, and fear of disappointment. And they don't want their peers to, to know that they've failed. And, and I, I think for me, and coming back to your question tomorrow, 
uh, I, I never, I had doubt, sure, I had self-doubt, but I always put, put myself in this category that I'm going to risk my vulnerability mm-hmm. and I'm going to do it again. And I'm going to do it again because I, I can hopefully better myself. And it really wasn't, the impetus was not necessarily my competitors that I was the honeybee at these races. I mean, once I won, everyone wanted to knock me off. And so <laughs> they, they'd all glom around me. And obviously that provided uh, motivation but really it was sort of this um, it's sort of this internal faith. It has nothing to do with, with religion. So faith within myself, I always thought, you know, faith breeds the highest probability of success. And if I just kind of keep that, even when I'm failing, but I keep that seed of faith, I'm going to be successful. I want to ask you a question about something you said, because I think it's, it's really important um, and, and powerful. You had said you kind of people don't put themselves out there because of fear of failure or a fear of other people thinking they failed. But I guess the question I would ask around that is, is what is the definition of failure? Because it, it, you know, if I looked at somebody else who put themselves out there and tried it, even if they if didn't succeed in whatever it is they were trying, in my mind, they're incredible because they did something I was afraid to do. So that like the, the thing about failures, I think it's so tricky because it, it's such a subjective thing. So how do, how do you look at that and how do you kind of advise people who are trying to train to get over that that fear that that they're going to look stupid or failure when really it's mostly in their head? Well, it is in their head. You stated it very well. It, it's um, it's sort of a mindset where people program themselves that, that I'm not I'm not going to succeed. Yeah. And fear of success and fear of failure are on this really small pinnacle. So, you know, people can have successes and they, they may have 10 successes and one failure and they look at themselves at, as a failure. You know, you're going to have all these things going up, up to it. And, then, you know, people always talk about it's kind of a trite saying, but it, there, there is some validity to it. You know, enjoy the journey when you're going up. And I think when you're enjoying the, the, the journey, uh, for me, Ironman race was always the big race yeah. of the year. But many, many times I didn't, you know, I didn't allow myself to be successful, to acknowledge yourself that, hey, you have succeeded. And so I, I had great difficulty, contrary to your question, I didn't always, I didn't always have the answers. And when I had this fear that I was failing, I, it really manifested into depression. And so I developed this anxiety and I had, I had depression quite badly. And it was something that I didn't admit for a long time because most people say, well, Dave, Scott, you're a six-time Ironman champion. You're on top of the world. Right. And I didn't allow myself to sort of relish and recognize those successes along the way. And trying to get back to your question, I, I think a lot of times when, they, when people set goals, they don't think of goals. They think of the overall objective. Like I have a year-long objective. That's fine, but I think really to be successful and to acknowledge those little steps, you, you have to have weekly goals. Mm. And it's important to write them down. I, I, I tell people to write them down, not just on the computer, like stick them on their refrigerator or somewhere, you know, on their bedpost or on their bathroom mirror, wherever they can see them. And, and those can be shared if you choose to share them or they can be just your little saying to yourself. And I think having these weekly goals and they can be small little steps. People will all of a sudden savor those successes and they won't fear failing. So first of all, I just wanna say thank you for sharing that. And, and I, I think it's this interesting quandary that a lot of us are in. And I put myself in this too, where you look at other people who have success that you want and you think everything everything is great. That's obviously why they're successful. They don't have the anxiety. They obviously don't have the fear. They obviously don't have the dread or whatever, the depression, but the, the, those two things are not mutually exclusive. Um, and I think that that's a, for me and for a lot of people, I think that's a real relief to know that you can be successful and have those things and you can not succeed and have those things. So you might as well go for it really at the end of the day, yeah. you're going to be there. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anxiety obviously can segue into depression, and yeah. I would I would create this this mountain that was insurmountable, mm. and I had kind of an all or nothing. Yeah, it took, me a, it took me a long time to sort of recognize that I 
I didn't need, and this isn't excessive, I didn't need to, to work out four hours a day, which was pretty common. Yeah. I would do, I'd swim, bike, run, I'd do strength training, and it was a four to, to eight hour a day. And so anything less than that, I had failed. So if I, if I had other life things that came in which and happens. which happens, it happens all the time. And if I, if I had set aside, well, I'm going to run 12 miles today and I could only run eight, then I failed. Yeah. And, and so like an alcoholic, uh, I, the, the thing that I would switch off is that it was all or nothing. If I couldn't do it the way I wanted to do it, I would go to zero. And so I would fuel myself in a negative way by not doing it. And it was sort of self-inflicted torture. And it's, it's, it's no different than, than, than anyone else, but the mindset that allowed me to kind of to overcome this. And I, and I saw psychologists, sports psychologists. I said, wow, you know, I, I'm this Ironman champion, but at times I just felt like I was a floating feather with no course. And I finally kind of got to the resolve that it, the physical part of what I do is huge. And the physical part controls my mental aptitude. And I have a steadfast rule for everyone. I just say, listen, if you have 20 minutes to exercise in a day, 20 minutes, you write that down. And generally after 20 minutes, you feel better. Right. So 20 minutes allows that morphine-like effect, those endorphins to, to sort of permeate your brain. And then all of a sudden you, you have resolve and you, and you don't fear. And you say, gee, I, you know, I'm, it wasn't what I really wanted to do, but it was okay. And, I, and it took me years and years and years to get to that point where I, I had this 20 minute rule and I adhere to it. I love it. So I love that for a couple of reasons. One is you're absolutely right. I think movement for 20 minutes always puts you in a better mood. And that's, you know, the research has proven that, but also I think in life goals too, what a great example of like, if I just, if I just break it down and do little increments, I'll, I'll still get there where we get so focused on everything has to be, whether it's an Ironman or life or work, whatever. And I know I'm guilty of this. Sure. Everything has to be all or none, you know, yeah. like just the other day I, I was going for a bike ride and I could only get in a half an hour. And I was so mad at myself because I, I needed 90 minutes. I was like, I'm the worst. I'm horrible. It's so stupid. Um, I have a question from Academy member that I'd love to ask you. And then I want to talk a little bit about the valleys and how do you like when, particularly when you're racing, yeah. when you get out of them. Yeah. So the question is, uh, and Jeff, by the way, does Ironman. So Ironman. So this is like, obviously a very specific question. I love it. When you're in a long monotonous situation during a race, do you try to stay laser focused if that's even possible or zone out and go on autopilot and let the training and the experience take over? I love this question. That's so good. Cause I think that again, applies to life of like, where do you white knuckle and where do you just go with the energy a little bit? Well, I, I think there's a real misnomer, uh, Jeff, in your, in your question and, and not to pick on you, but I, I think when we look at disassociating from discomfort and I, and I call, you know, when you're exercising and Jeff, you're an Ironman person, you've identified yourself. So you know what it's like when you get to certain periods and they may hit, hit you throughout the course of that day where all of a sudden you feel real flat. Yeah. And when people say, Oh, I disassociate from the discomfort or pain. I don't, I don't use pain when I'm exercising. Know. It's controlled discomfort. You have a barometer of discomfort and you ratchet it up or you ratchet it down a little bit, but you keep a finite lid on it. And so when people say, oh, you, you just relegate your mindset and go back to your training, that all sounds rosy and, you know, just like a, you know, a bucket of cookies, but it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. The, the way you get back on track is to recognize the discomfort. Oh, my quads really ache. My low back hurts. Mm -hmm. Gee, my breathing rate's really high. I feel flat. You have all the, those intuitive physical cues and they manifest into the psychological part where you just rip yourself to pieces. The way you get back on track is that you don't think of the magnitude of finishing your day. And, and Jeff, I'll talk about you. If, if you're feeling bad at the first hour on the bike, you've got out of the swim and now you're on the bike and you've got X hours left and you feel pretty rotten, but you've had a lot of train rides like that. It's a good thing that you brought that up. You really have to do it short term. So I always tell people, you know, look at that tree or that fence post or even time in just counting 30 seconds to a minute maximum and you think about all the physical things that you control. What I tell people is think about their breathing. And so if you take slow inhales through your nose and then exhale through your nose as best you can, depending on your breathing rate, it, close, it, it shortens your 
fight or flight symptoms, your sympathetic nervous system, which can be revved up because you're saying, I feel crummy. I've trained months and months before this. This is the worst day of my life. Everything's falling apart. You, you do it short term. So you think about your breathing that calms down your respiratory rate and your heart rate. And it creates this internal calmness, but it really, it really feels the psychological part of not feeling consumed by it. So do it really short term. I tell people think 30 seconds to a minute, get through that. Mm -hmm. I also have people look at like, if you're on the bike and I use that example, look at your quads. Like when you were riding tomorrow the other day and you only went a half hour and you, you wanna go harder and faster, you don't have much time. Look at your legs, you got muscles in your legs, look at them and, and recognize those are yours and they work and, and talk to them. Wiggle your fingers, move your face around a little bit. And, and a lot of people look like, uh, for lack of a better term, it looks like they've been shot in the back when they're exercising because they're, they're psychologically under duress. And you really want to have a, a calmness that starts with your mouth, your face, your neck, your shoulders. And you do this physical inventory from the top of your head all the way down to your toes and back up, but keep it short. So I also like that too, because there's, there is a little bit of uh, getting in touch with your body and a little bit of distraction because you're giving yourself something to do. Like it's, it, it feels like it's a little bit of both. I want to, I want to, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and ask you about obstacles because what you are talking about kind of it leads me to that question. So, um, you know, you're talking about uh, when you're in pain, not disassociating from the discomfort. And a lot of that discomfort comes from your body, right? You've got aches and pains, but a lot of that discomfort comes from external obstacles. Wind, the water is choppy. I, I don't know. There's a bottleneck somewhere in the race. I mean, fill in the blank, you know, better than me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At this, no, I don't. You, say, you stated it well again. <laughs> bad conditions bad conditions right but but there there's internal and there's external obstacles so but you have a little bit of a different view on those things and we were talking about this offline whatever that was a couple of weeks ago and so i'd love to hear that again your perspective on the obstacles and why you think that kind of bogs people down so much versus kind of how you said you you really tackle them i had an interview tomorrow um before the 1987 race and I remember vividly that was the sixth one that I won and the reporter asked he said oh Dave you seem to really relish bad conditions violent wind big big waves uh extreme hot conditions no cloud cover whatsoever and, and, and Hawaii can't have all of those and quite often it does yeah and I, you know, I was thinking inside when he asked this question, because I could see it affected the other, it was a press conference with the other athletes I was going to race in, in a couple of days. And I could see it bothered them just thinking about all those negative That's things. Exactly. They just said, you know, this is just going to be a wicked day because now this report is reciting probably the worst day that we could possibly have. But it actually, in actuality, it, it was true. I thought about it for a second before I answered, and I said, I don't like those conditions at all. I'm thinking this to myself. Yeah. I like a nice calm day, a little bit of cloud <laughs> cover, cooler day. But at the same time, I, I had found, not just from this one question, that the conditions never last for a long time. And I think, mm. let, let, let's just, uh, Kona winds are notorious. And it can be big winds, 50 to 60 mile an hour crosswinds, but they never blow for 112 miles in your face. And so when they would when they would come on, and I and I would do this in training as well. And I at the time, a, a lot of my training was in California and in Colorado. Now we had big winds in the Sacramento Valley. And when I get in those winds, if you mentally fight them and then you physically show the how it's tormenting you, you you clench your fist, you grit your teeth, right. your upper traps are tight, your stomach's locked up, you're not pedaling smooth circles or whatever it is, you're slowing down. Right. You're, you've really failed because you haven't allowed yourself to be successful in those types of conditions. So I would always look at it, sort of a similar answer to, to Jeff, it, it, it was short term. And how can I relax in, in that period to overcome those conditions? And so I answered the reporter coming back to the questions. I, I basically said, uh, I, I don't mind the, those conditions. I was basically saying, it doesn't bother me. I don't see them. And I didn't want to sound like I was arrogant. I said, I don't really mind those conditions. It probably will be rough and windy tomorrow. 
And that just kind of decimated about 95% of the competitors thinking, oh, Dave Scott really likes these conditions. He's abnormal. <laughs> you know, why is this guy thinking this? But the, the truthful side of it is, it is really to control that behavioral pattern because it's a, it's a, it's a stress. And the stress when you have that, when you exercise or when you're thinking about something, you, you can certainly in exercise, you can produce adrenaline and, and adrenaline is good for short term, but not long term. And you can also produce cortisol and, and those cortisol levels go up and they manifest really in long term destruction. C cortisol goes up and that's a favorable thing. But if you allow it to really heighten over time with the conditions that you described, it can wreck you. So I, I'm kind of gathering two really important insights that I really want the Launch Street community to pay attention to. And one is, um, to your point, you're letting the external obstacles dictate how you behave or how you perform. Of course, the, the, some wind's going to slow you down. Of course, right? Like choppy is choppy. But, but I think all too often we give in to the external conditions versus pushing through them and, and knowing that they're going to be short term. Um, and, and the other thing I'd say is that you said is it's exactly what I just said. It's short term. So that's not going to last forever. And frankly, even if the wind lasted for the, for the entire Ironman, you'll be done at some point. This is not like forever. <laughs> so I know that sounds very callous because it's hours and hours, but, but, but I do think that, um, and I also think that a lot of us, and I'm guilty of this, we look at those external conditions and we worry about them before they even happen or in the future of them happening. So I'll just use the wind as the easiest example. Like you're on your bike, it gets a little windy and then your brain just goes, oh shit. Like, yeah. I'm gonna spend an entire ride in the wind. You don't know that. But now yeah. you're panicked, not just about the moment you're in but about two hours down the road that hasn't even, hasn't even happened yet. And that to yeah. your point with cortisol, that's gotta take so much mental and physical energy out of your performance when you do that. Yeah, it happens to us, not just racing, but it, it certainly does during, during a race, if you let it heighten and, over, and overcome you. Know, I, I think, you know, I hear a lot of athletes or people that are going into a corporate media and they have a plan. We all have a plan and we want that script to play out. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, you're going to do your Ironman. You're going to have a plan on what you're capable of doing. Yeah, no, no, no I just got, and I'll follow you very closely. Uh, <laughs> that'll be fun tomorrow, and I can interview you after you're done. Perfect. So, no, that'll be good. We can tell all your lines. Now, now the pressure's on. <laughs> yeah, the, the pressure is on. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think a lot of times when we have a plan, that script never plays out. Yeah. And so one of the things that you kind of alluded to and what I followed always is to react and respond and be spontaneous to the moment. And, and be adaptable. And I think the spontaneity is what people lose because they become too rigid. If, if you're planning on going into a meeting, you know that a, a couple of people are just rattlesnakes in the meeting mm -hmm. and you've already programmed that and you know that you're not gonna get on the good side of them. Well, that's probably gonna be the outcome. Right. I, when I was coaching athletes and I have been and I still do, I coach my swim group today. I've had athletes that I've had in my group that I do not like. And they're abrasive. They've got rugged, rough personalities. And my first response is, don't let them win. I want to win. And so how do I win them? And it's not with sugarcoating them. It's just being right. very candid. I, my candor always has a tendency to kill me a little bit. But at the same time, I want them to be on my side. I don't want them to have a fence or to push back or a preconceived notion about Dave Scott. Mm. And one of the things that, that really helped me sort of uh, late in my career, when I was uh, 38 plus, I decided to do the Ironman when I was 40. That was 1994. And at that time, there, there wasn't professional athletes really in any sport that were 40 years old that were competitive. And, and I had been out of triathlon almost five years. I'd kind of dabbled in some, in some um some sort of recreational triathlons, but I, I hadn't compete, competed with the big boys in the big league. And I, I went to a friend of mine who was an undergraduate with me. He was now teaching. He had, he had his doctorate at, at CU Boulder and his name happened to be Jeff. And he said, hey, Dave, why don't you come in? And, and I know you've got Ironman coming up. You're, you're 40. You've got a lot of publicity on this. You, I'm sure you feel a lot of pressure. You haven't raced in five years. And the last time you raced was with Mark Allen and you lost. So, you know, basically, you know, why are you doing this? But let's unravel that he told me a couple things and I'll, I'll get to my point quickly. Yeah. No. He, he, he said, um, 
I said, I want you to write down on the right side of the paper what you should do. And so I had this huge list. My two boys were born during that five year period, 89 and, and the latter part of 90. Uh, 15 months apart so all of a sudden I had my my two boys loved them to pieces and they were but they were a distraction for okay I got this Iron Man thing and I'm the you know I was, I was the guy for a while and I'm sure that I still have this bullseye on me so I wrote this should list and it was quite long he said I'm going to give you 10 or 15 minutes to write this down and then he said on the left hand side of the paper write down what you want to do mm. well I I had about three things. The want to do was real fast. You know, I said, well, I want to be a good father. At the time I was happily married. I said, oh, I want to be a good, a good husband and I want to race fast. I want to race to my potential. And you know, whether those are those three pretty darn close. And the should have was this long list. Like I got, you got to get back to this business wise. I got to do this. And all of a sudden it just mentally unraveled me. And he goes, I want you to take a look at that should list. And he said, what, what can you take responsibility for? And just tell whomever or decide within yourself that you're going to put this off because you've got this big event coming up, but I'm going to get back to you. It wasn't a zero. And it became really simple. I said, well, I can take that should list and I can cut it down to about one thing. So he said, we'll do that. And he said on the, on the want list, this is what you want to do. Remind yourself of these three things. And, and then he kind of flipped it to the race. He said, what, what do you really want to do in the race? And I said, you know, I just want to control my own potential, push my, you know, my, my destiny button, whatever that is, and, and allow myself to just supersede maybe the top goal that I envisioned. And, and, and that's how I looked at, looked at those races. He added one more element. And I've, I've told this with my athletes all the time, and we've kind of alluded to this tomorrow. He, he said, uh, a very simple thing when you're in that race and it comes back to the spontaneity comment yeah he said do what you can do at the moment in other words be present do what you can do at the moment great advice and i know and I, and I just i use it all the time because it it pertains to you know your listeners and anyone else that says hey dave i don't exercise you're this you know super guy who does all this exercise i just want to start and i and i always tell them don't procrastinate yeah it, you know allocate the time write it down do what you can do at the mo moment and just like you tomorrow that did the 30 minute ride mm -hmm. you only had 30 minutes but it you know it, it does provide that seed of great psychological emotional uplift that you have well and i i think that that advice is so important in a lot of ways in life about being present and not letting not letting the past or the future decide how you perform in the moment and uh, I think it's very easy to either, I, in some ways, I think the past, the future is actually more baggage than the past for a lot of us, because it's what could happen, what could go wrong, right? Like, it's all that stuff. Um, and I love that. And I want to actually parlay that into a question about um, mental, I don't know if it's mental toughness, but one of the things that I've heard you talk about in interviews is, you know, you get into the valleys, the mental, not, not your body, not, oh, my back hurts on the bike, but like, you know, the mental places of, well, all of it. So I don't want to put words in your mouth of what your mental place is. I know mine is rough. I can tell you that. Um, and, well, and, and it's demoralizing and it's in that place where you're sure you can't win or you can't finish even. It's not even win at that point. Um, you know, it's where you just, you, you just don't think you have an in you no matter what you did and to kind of to what you said earlier your plan falls apart on you usually and was it mike tyson that said everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face and i feel like that's life and kind of what you were saying but very apropos <laughs> yeah right what do yeah. you what do you do to get out of the valleys that i mean when you're doing an iron man i mean for someone like me this is going to be a 17 hour endeavor you're a lot faster but it's a long time and you know the race of life is a long time. So what do you do to get out of that? Well, I kind of alluded to it with my answer to, to Jeff that you yeah. all of a sudden reduce the amount of time, the worry time, and you just alluded to it to, tomorrow. You're looking at the future, you're forecasting. Yeah. Things aren't going well, how bad you're doing, and therefore it's going to be catastrophic at the end. And no how are you going to get out of this? And how are you going to explain this to your friends and family? And then I felt pressure from the journalists that were covering it and yeah. you know you stuck your neck on the line Dave and you're just doing so poorly and those thoughts just race through you once you ha have this self-doubt 
and you kind of lose this faith within yourself. And all of a sudden the, the negative loco locomotion machine just rolls over the top of you. So loud. Yeah. It's, it, it, and, and I think there's a, there's kind of a, a, a misstatement when people say, Oh, you always have to remain optimistic. Mm. And it has this rosy sort of, uh, connotation to it. I don't mind people saying, gee, I'm an optimistic person. I'm always looking for the good in something. But I always talk about realistic optimism. And realistic optimism allows you to get out of these valleys per, per your question. And I'll, I'll use an example yeah. tomorrow. The last, um, the last Ironman I did, and, and I'm never introduced in, in a public forum. Oh, Dave's six-time Ironman champion. That's usually they stop there. And he also had three seconds, so that's okay. But they would never say, oh, by the way, he got fifth. And the last race I did was 1996. And people have asked me, you know, what was my greatest race? And I say 1996. And they said, well, I didn't even know you raced. And I said, well, I got fifth place. And I'll, I'll, I'll sort of glide through this. In 94, I was 40. I got second. And I thought I could win that race in 1995. I, I dropped a, a weight in the gym on my toe and broke my toe. And so I was out of that race. Wow. <laughs> and, 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 and you know, that wasn't wise. And then 96, I came back. Now I'm 42. Quietly, I thought I could win the race. When the gun went off, I felt good. And I was optimistic. And I was realistic on, on how I could push myself. But I, I didn't have a good marathon coming off the bike in 1994. And I said, I'm going to run fast in this race. And if I have to win it on the run, I know I can do that. And, and it was this sort of internal confidence that I sort of instilled in myself. I had the worst swim of my life ever. Mm -hmm. And I came out of the water way behind. I knew the people that I was with. I said, I should be up there about 300 meters. And I'm with this sea of piranhas in the swim. And, and this person's too slow. Why am I swimming with them? I couldn't get out of it. But I said, don't worry. I got on the bike and I said, I'm going to take off on the bike. And, and uh, at about nine miles, the press truck went by me. Uh, I was well behind the leaders. Mm -hmm. And they obviously knew who I was. And I knew a lot of the people in the press. The press truck slowed down. There's probably 30, 30, 40 people on this big truck that's open air. And I could see a lot of the faces of people that have interviewed me. And they had these sort of forlorn looks like, oh, Dave, hey, you're 42. What are you doing? Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, I should be having a glass of wine on the side or, or a margarita or something. And they zoomed off up to the leaders. And that kind of set the tone for me. Like I said, I've, I've started out poorly. I have the plan, which you alluded to tomorrow. And the plan wasn't in place on the swim. I, I, I didn't prevail on that. Now I'm on the bike, but I'm going to really take off. Well, that just started this cascading effect of negativity. And I couldn't get out of it. So now I'm at 15 miles and I just said, my legs feel rugged. I wasn't breathing hard. I just felt like muscularly I was really laboring. Mm. And I kind of had this moment for a long time that it was, woe is me. Yeah. This shouldn't be happening to me. Mm. You know, I'm better than this. Very externally driven. I exactly. And I allowed that to just put this wet wool blanket over the top of me and I couldn't get out of it. And finally, finally, as you recited, the bike is 112 miles at about 85 miles. So I'm three hours and 40 something minutes into the ride. And I finally said, I am way back. I don't know what place I was in. I thought I was in 50th place, never been in that position before in the world championships. But I said to myself, uh, I have an opportunity, a opportunity. And now this optimism prevailed to run the marathon. I get to run the marathon. A marathon's a long run and I'm, I get to run this and I'm gonna run it fast because that was my plan before, but now I had reignited this internal fire. And so I saw some of my family and friends from around mile 90 all the way to the finish where they were out on the course. I think they'd almost given up on me, but not entirely. They knew I was yeah, I was like a, a you know deranged Wolverine at times, where I could just you know dig out of the trenches and say I'm going to go after it. You know, I'm not going to be fatigued at any moment. So that, I think they still had hope that I would do well. I, and I hollered at him. I said, "Tell me where number ten is." I wanted to know where the tenth place man. I said, "This isn't going to look good on my resume, but if I can move for wherever I am right now up to tenth place in the top ten, this is going to be an amazing day." 
So I got off the bike not knowing where I was and, and then never really knew until the next day, but I kept passing people and I was running magnificently for me. I was running with this open mind. And I think what, what changed was it took the entire swim and bike to get out of this just horrible pit, this valley where I just couldn't draw myself out. I wasn't doing what I could do at the moment. Yeah. Now I was on the run and I was passing people and at mile 16 or 17, I caught the 10th place person. And I said, I got to keep going. I, I, you know, I'm, I, I feel great. Uh, and at mile 21, I was able to catch the fifth guy. And I, I just, you know, if the run was not 26 miles, but maybe 36 miles, I, I might've been able to, to catch the other ones. But that particular day coming in fifth and, and getting off the bike in 26th, I allowed myself to wallow in this valley, this mucky valley of mental demise. And it took me a long time. I said, golly, I'm, I'm much stronger than this. But when I look at the greatest race that I've ever done, that was it. So there's a couple really admirable things about that, Dave, that I have to say. One is um, those valleys can be short or long, depending on what you're dealing with, Iron Man or on a daily basis with kids, family, work. Um, but I think there's two cool, uh, like, I wish I had, well, I'll just listen to my own podcast later. I was like, I wish I was taking notes, not holding my computer, but I'll do that later. Uh, one is you set a goal that you could go after that was, that was big, but attainable for you. So you, the goal, right, to catch up with that 10th person gives you something that when you're in that valley that can help pull you out, because you're like, okay, if I could do that, then I've had a huge day because I've given it my all. I have achieved, you know, a great, I've closed a gap that was huge. So I think there's a lot of value in setting a goal that is attainable, but big. It may not have been the end goal you were going for to begin with, but it's big. It's big. big. The thing, big. Yeah. The other thing I'd say that's really admirable about it is turning that obstacle into an opportunity. So that kind of mindset of how lucky am I? that I get to try to catch up with this guy on the run. And I, how lucky am I that I get to crush the run versus, oh my God, two of the three events are done. And now I'm like, I forget it. I'm just going to coast my way in. Yogging, as I would say, I'm going to yog my way in. <laughs> but, but I think those are, I think those are both very cool uh, and more than cool. I think they're very admirable pieces of advice that to really pay attention to because um, I think when we're in the valley, it's again, and I hear a lot in what you're saying, this theme of like not making it all or none about these bite size and these chunks, but but in a really powerful way. Um, but but that really does help us get out of it of like, if I can just get to here, right, then I know I can keep going and I can keep going. So yeah, I didn't have a question yeah. there. I just wanted to say that. No, it's a, it's a very good statement. I mean, it, 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 it was a huge obstacle. It was a mental obstacle. And physically I had ridden, much, much faster in thousands of train rides. And I just couldn't yeah. get my legs, they were tired. In hindsight, I probably did yeah. too much on the bike. They just didn't perform. And I had some of my competitors go by me, sort of pulling me along. Come on, Dave, go with me. And I just said, you know, I can't, I'm tired. And it was no different than a train ride. But I, but I had always felt that this obstacle, as you just stated, yeah. could be an opportunity. And then all of a sudden my optimism, which I have, and I'm real about it, just yeah. soared. I, and, and it wasn't about, you know, I didn't have a vendetta about uh, catching X person. You know, I knew there were a lot of my fellow competitors ahead of me. Most of them were quite a bit younger than me, but I, you know, yeah. admired them and knew them. And, it, and it, was, it really wasn't about, I have to beat that person. It was just how hard can I push myself? Right. And this outcome is gonna be fantastic because all, drive myself to my utmost potential. Well, and the 10th person isn't Greg, whoever Greg is, you know, it, it is a ranking, you know, it's, right. it's, it's a totally different mindset. I got a question, another question from the Academy on your story, because they said it was so powerful. Um, do you find when you get out of the Valley is that it's like an instant turnaround? So I'm reading the questions we talked, is it an instant turnaround or do you find it a slow progression out? Uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, a little bit of a little bit of both. I, I think if you limit the amount of destruction, 
quite often when you get out of that that valley, you you recognize success right away. And I alluded back to Jeff, you yeah. know, it's really short term, 30 seconds. Well, I've got five, six hours left. No, just think 30 seconds. Love don't that. go any don't go any further than that. And, and and people have always asked me, they say, gosh, the Ironman is such a long, long day. And, and, and tomorrow you said, you know, I'm going to be out there for 17 hours. You're going to have these periods where you're going to feel like, oh boy, this is a, this is a rough day. But I, I've always said it goes by real fast. Hmm. I said, oh, the day goes by very quickly. And I don't think it, 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 it re really matters if you do it in eight hours or something and, uh, and it takes you 17 hours. And, I, and I've had a lot of athletes that I've coached that have been in that 15, 16, 17 hour range or close to 17 hours, 16 plus. Okay. And, and, and yeah, we break it up into pieces and, and you're, you're playing the, this game. And I, I've always said, and I haven't lost this even to this day where I get in the pool, I just swam uh, in a workout and, and I'm giving the workout to my group, but then I'm in the water and there's another group where I'm giving the workout to them. And uh, as I told you, I broke my leg. So I'm hobbling around this bloody walker. So it's like <laughs> dragging a piece of dead driftwood. And it just, you know, bothers me mentally. Like I'm not, I can't go fast like I can. So I'm always looking, you know, the other people, what well, can I hang with them for a little bit longer? I'm always playing this game and it's not, it's not win or lose right now because I, I can go as hard as I can and say, wow, that was pretty good. Yeah. So, and so like, I'll use the real names, Annie, Christine. Oh, they all just pounded me into the ground. Craig, they all beat me today, but you know, I, they knew I was there. I kind of stung them for a little bit and they knew my presence was there. And, and I finished the workout and say, wow, ah, you know, I had a good day. I worked really, really hard. It was, a, it was a lot of fun. So the game is always in place. Your, your comment and your question about sometimes is it a slow grind out of it? Yes. And that was a slow grind. But really look, coming back to that 96 race, it was really in the first half mile of the run where I felt like the sky had opened up yeah. and everything was attainable. There, I wasn't going to get fatigued. Everything was wide open. So how far and how fast could I push myself? And the results will unfold. So I'm going to share two quick things with you. And then I'd love for you to share because you have a, an incredible online training program too. So I want to make sure <clears throat> that you have a chance to share that with people. But just on all of that, I just want to say, because I've already taken your advice since you and I was fortunate enough to talk to you offline kind of before the podcast. One is it was super windy the other day while I was biking and it made me think of you and the obstacle stuff. And I started smiling on the bike, yeah. just smiling. That's and I started correct. really, I was laughing as like I was being pushed around, but normally that would have panicked me. I also laughed because it was freezing cold. So the spit like dried on my teeth and I was like, it's just so funny. You can't be glamorous all the time. No, 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 no. But, <laughs> but it was like a little game and, you know, I hear yeah. you play about kind of all these little games you play to get out and to make the ownership inside. Yesterday when I was swimming, um, I think I told you I wanted to go a mile to make sure that I could even do it because I hadn't done that yet ever. I hadn't really gone more than like 35 minutes. And the little game in my head was, could I stay in the pool longer than the people, other people? I didn't know them. I have no, I didn't talk to them. It doesn't matter. What mattered yeah. is the minute they got out of the pool before me, I was like, yes, nailed it. I'm winning the day. Yeah. I was victory. slower than everybody. Like none of that mattered. My little head games, but you know, I hear you talk about that and kind of those head games that come up of how you get yourself to the next place. But you're so right. They're they're short term, and they all those little short terms stack up to the bigger the bigger wins. Yeah, yeah. Those little ones are huge. And and again, I I didn't really savor those or recognize those, but that's how I train my first started training for Ironman, there was no one else that I could play with. Uh, I had a close friend who was a, a physician and he would come around the weekends and, you know, we'd sort of play these tag, you know, uh, Mike, you turn around early, you got five miles lead on me on the bike, I'm gonna see if I can catch you. And we would have these magnificent races all by ourselves. And sometimes it would come down to the last mile where I, I would catch him or I wouldn't. And it was just this crazy game and, and yeah. to, Motivate myself now is no different than what you just said in the pool. I, I do this all the time. And if I see someone ahead of me on the bike, I say, can I close the gap by X miles? Maybe I can get them by the city line. 
you know, I, I play these crazy games with myself, but it allows me, it, you know, allows me to be relaxed and calm and it keeps me hungry. And, and I, and I think where people say, Oh, I, I'm just not going to do that. I don't, I, you know, and, and that's fine. You know, if you choose just to, to exercise, it's very comfortable and it's conversation pace and that makes you feel good. I'm perfectly with you, but I, I, I think it's sometimes important and it may not manifest with exercise, where you take yourself out of that guarded area. Yeah. And I think, I think too many people are guarded. And, and that guarded feeling, I, I, I always feel like, wow, you don't really know what your capabilities are. You don't really know what your potential is. And how, how do you envision yourself sort of moving forward? So I, I always feel that everyone has a skill, a gift, and exploit that. And then on the other side, things that you aren't very good at, don't run away from them. Don't, don't hide from the, your weaknesses. Challenge yourself by doing those weaknesses. And you may fumble along maybe in the bottom 4% of whatever it is, but keep challenging yourself. I'll, I'll use an example. Uh, I'm in my uh, mid 60s and I look at a lot of 60 year old men and women, 70 year olds and and I, I'm, all, I'm crazy about posture and strength and head position and, and balance. And so I, you know, I pick on balance. I, I have pretty good balance because I do it all the time. So when I have camps or I teach people and I get a 30 year old guy who's got you know, great looking quads and beautiful muscles. And I say, let's, let's stand on one foot and pick this a dime up off the floor. And this guy's wobbling all over the planet. <laughs> You know, at the same time, <laughs> I'm not doing it just to exploit my, you know, my ego, but it yeah. really is just to, to kind of recognize, well, you're not very good at this. Let's practice this. Your balance, which becomes more apparent as you age in every decade, work on it. Don't let it go on a decline. So I can't believe we're pretty much out of time because I have so many more questions. But <laughs> before I ask you my last question, um, where can people go to train with you, connect with you. I know you have an incredible program as well. So just talk a little bit about all that. Oh, it's, uh, I, I have a, um, I have an easy reach. I, you, you can Google me. There's either a, a felon, a musician, there's an astronaut, there's Dave Scott. So a triathlete. So you, you can find me pretty easily. Um, I have a newsletter that I put out uh, twice a month. And in that newsletter, I, I cover lots of different topics. It's not just swim, bike, run, and mobility, stretching, strength. Now that's a bigger audience. But I talk about um, aging. I talk about health issues. I, you know, I talk about cardiovascular health. I talk about skin skin issues, and so and I do a lot of videos. So uh, also uh, in my newsletter, you can send me a note. Um, a lot of people refer to me as the man. I don't really like that, but that was given by one of my competitors years ago. And so it says, ask the man, I've used that as my tag. So you can write me a question. I love answering some, some are video, some I answer personally, some I post. So the, the, I'll say the newsletter is the easiest thing and, and you can come to my website and just kind of peruse through that. I have a lot of videos and articles on there. Well, I will put the link to all that in our show notes, of course, and on our webpage and all that good stuff. So Great. here's my last question for you and I'll preface it with a very quick story. Um, so I did cross, I do CrossFit. I'm taking a break obviously right now to do Ironman, but I did it for, I've done it for six or seven years, Tran transformed my life. It's one of my favorite things, but I have a girlfriend in CrossFit who's a dear, dear friend. And she and I are about the same in terms of like weights, heavy, right? It's same age yeah. group. And we're like 20 years older than everybody else in class. And we used to have this running joke when we were lifting where we would take half, half kilos and we would put them on the ends just to beat the other person by one kilo. And other people in the class oh. thought we were mean for doing that to each other. But awesome. Yeah, we knew that it, this was our way of pushing ourselves and each other. I and mean, it was very friendly between us. And we're both highly competitive people. We both wanted to win. If there was a real competition, like we were at it once that, you know, buzzer went off. But but on in, in daily life, it pushed us both, even though other people were probably horrified by our behavior. You've got this whole iron wars with Mark Allen was, you know, you got, and I've seen, incredible. as I was doing research for this, I found these incredible interviews with you two and just, you know, the, I mean, the press was all over it. You guys were neck and neck in races, like literally side by side, but you have a very, I, I'd say, enlightened view on competition so to close out our podcast will you share that because I think life is a game and I think there's a lot of competition in life and most of us let that 
hold us back, but you see it a little differently. Uh, I, I, again, I'll use a word that I, I've shared with, it's an opportunity. And so I never looked at competition as an anvil on my shoulder. Uh, I knew going into Ironman and, and Mark Allen was my most fierce competitor. We yeah. had many, many battles together that he would be ready. And I, I had won six before he had won one. And we had this battle in 1989. Yeah. And I knew it was going to be probably a, a has now been a historic battle. Yep. Uh, and there's documentaries on it. It's yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot. And yeah. I just did another clip earlier this week on it. So we talk about it a lot. Uh, and we were ferocious competitors when we would line up, but there was also mutual respect and admiration. Mm -hmm. And I don't really see that in some of the sports. I see this sort of caustic, nasty attitude. I think you use your, you use competition in a lot of different ways, whether it's business or whether it's athletic, athletic realm as an asset. And I always thought Mark was an asset to me because he was going to bring out the best performance in me. I had this internal pride that I could push myself and did I need Mark? No, not really. But at right. the same time, he, he, he was a, you know, I, I think he was a plus to to my performance and I, I think what gets skewed in life and skewed in competition and you just kind of alluded to it you put that half kilo plate on the outside <laughs> so someone would notice that you kind of boosted the, <laughs> the bar a bit uh, I, I think it's the right thing yeah. I, I think it's, I think it's always the right thing and one of the one of the, the to try to answer your questions and it's sort of my coaching philosophy and when I put a program on I see a lot of coaches that will write out a program and the athlete knows exactly what it is they know the workloads they know the heart rate or the power or whatever the speed whatever they're trying to do and for example and I'll use this today uh, in my swim group quite often I keep them guessing and keeping them guessing keeps them hungry yeah. It makes them a little bit anxious because they don't know what's coming up. Right. And, and quite often when I, if they've, if they've gone through half of the workout, which they did today. And I said, well, there's three main segments. They've done two plus. And I say, okay, we've got the third one. And quite often I'll tag something on the end. So when they're breathing hard, they're fatigued. And I come in there with a deadpan poker face and I say, well, we got this one little effort on the end and I can see the moan and groan but at the same, same time. I'll just say that I want you to just think about what you're capable of doing. Yeah. And I think when people look at their capabilities as this um, realistic optimism, they measure the bar higher than what they've done. Mm -hmm. And so the example I just gave in, in the pools, I said, okay, we're going to do this. I let them think about it for about 20 seconds. Their first reaction is, oh no, this is going to be too uncomfortable. It's too hard. I'm really tired. And, and I switch it around and I say, well, I want you to maintain good stroke integrity and I want you to go as hard as you can. And when I leave it, go as hard as you can. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I have everyone that's on my side, but they have to turn on that switch in their brain that says, hey, I can do this. It's not just for Dave because he's my coach. I can do this. And so when they finish it and they're completely smashed and their arms are dead and they're breathing hard. It's amazing though, right? They feel good about themselves yeah. tomorrow. And that's the whole point. Yeah. Well, I, I think um, I was thinking this as you were sharing the earlier story too. There's a lot of satisfaction, not in just building your strength, but I actually, and I, I'm a big believer of leveraging your strengths in life, but more so in pushing through the challenging things. I, I think that's way more satisfying. Um, there's a lot more glory in that than doing what you already know you can do easily. So yeah, yeah Dave, this was phenomenal. I said I, I could I could keep going, but we're out of time. So <laughs> well, we'll, we'll set up another one, uh, maybe uh, pre-race pre -race for you tomorrow. Yeah. And race, so. <laughs> Well, I can't thank you enough. This was incredibly insightful. I know the people on got a lot and I'm looking forward to releasing this to the public, but I just, I think your story is a, is a really powerful one. And I just want to remind the listeners that as you, and I know, I have no doubt you were all doing this, but those lessons apply in so many places in our lives, not just Ironman or uh, a 5k race or, you know, kind of one of those it's, it's everything. And so Dave, you're incredibly impressive. Thank you for sharing your insights. Um, yeah, this was great. 
you're insightful tomorrow. So thanks, thanks for having me again.